Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for that wonderful welcome. And Ben, thank you so much for all you do for PSC, all that the team does in the office of PSC, and all of the PSC activists all over the country who never give up, never give in, and just carry on with the campaigning and changing opinions and changing minds. And uh, I think the achievements of PSC culminating in that massive, almost million strong march on the US Embassy wasn't the product of a few days of WhatsApp messages all over the country. It was a product of 30 years of campaigning for Palestine all over the country. And so, never underestimate the importance of those uh, paste table stalls outside Tesco's on a, windy, on a windy Saturday morning in a high street somewhere, having a lengthy conversation with somebody who doesn't necessarily understand much about the subject but is prepared to listen. Those things actually matter, and that is how you change minds and change opinions. And it was very kind of you to mention um, the recent election result in Islington North. Just I want to say this, I know some of you here, maybe many of you here, came over to help us in that campaign. I want to say thank you very, very much. We ran the campaign on the principles of peace, on the principles of justice, on the principles of human rights, and of the very simple demand of ending arms supplies to Israel and demanding a ceasefire to save life in Gaza and support for the rights of the Palestinian people to their own future and their own self-determination. That was on every leaflet and every speech I made, and we won. <laughs> the horror of what is happening at the moment cannot be overstated or overestimated. I don't know the exact number. I don't know if anybody does at the moment, but we're looking at over 40,000 deaths in Gaza since October. And as uh, the General Secretary of the UN, Antonio Guterres, said in October, it didn't all start last October. It goes right back to the um, Nakba, to the driving of people into Gaza, into the West Bank, and it goes back to decades and decades of occupation. Occupation which has become the norm for most Palestinian people for all of their lives. And I must say, I constantly find it hard to get my head around the idea that every time you leave your house, you're gonna find an occupying soldier. Every time you go down the road, you're gonna find a checkpoint. And every time you try and go somewhere where you've maybe made an appointment, an arrangement, or simply just to go to work or college or school, you could be delayed for hours by completely irrational behavior by aggressive soldiers as part of the occupying force. And then the settlements that move in on the West Bank, taking the land, taking the water, taking the trees, taking the very livelihood, and then settlers using the cover of the world's attention on Gaza to go and burn and destroy Palestinian villages and further drive them out of their very existence and very livelihood. And so the amazing resilience of the Palestinian people who've suffered this for all of the length of my life and see no immediate end to it. I just think the solidarity we have to express is so very, very important. And today's conference is about expressing our solidarity, but also the very practical campaigns that we have to mount. The success in forcing divestment from Barclays and from the arms trade uh, companies is a huge one. And uh, you mentioned my own borough where I say a big thank you to Islington PSC for their consistent demand for ending the account with Barclays and also divestment from the pension fund and so many others around the country have done the same. The abuse that people have suffered merely from making those demands is huge, but the success is so important. And sometimes I think we don't do enough. Sometimes I think, well, we're just out marching. What are we, couldn't we do more? Shouldn't we do more? And then we speak to people in Gaza, in the West Bank, 
hear voices from people in the refugee camps and they say, look, anything you do boosts our morale and gives us hope that there are people out there that are expressing that solidarity. And that, of course, is infectious and that's what's encouraged so many students to take part in the encampments and the demonstrations, which has educated so many people and our solidarity is very, very important. And the point that um, was just made by Fran and made by Ben about um, the attitude of various governments and the sanctions policies that are implemented. The British government is very keen to promote sanctions against Russia because of the war in Ukraine and the occupation of Ukraine. The British government is very keen to have sanctions against Venezuela. The British government is very keen on having sanctions against quite a lot of people and frequently does so. Well, in the case of Israel, just think of the numbers of legal judgments and international opinions that have been proffered against Israel for its behavior, its human rights abuses, and its occupation of Gaza and the West Bank. The United Nations General Assembly on numerous occasions, numerous occasions, over the whole of its lifetime has um, made statements and demands very strongly critical of Israel and of the occupation. There's a whole host of Security Council resolutions as well. And then we have the uh, International Court of Justice and its most recent decisions and opinions when South Africa very bravely took that step to uh, take a case against Israel for acts of genocide against people in Gaza. I went there to the International Court of Justice. It was, uh, it was almost surreal, absolute midwinter, freezing cold. We had to be there at 5.30 in the morning in order to get into the court. And so we're hanging around, having a long conversation with my friend, um, Melanchon from France about what was going to happen that day and then we went in and heard the presentation which was absolutely brilliantly done and then eventually the opinion and the judgment came out. Well, you can't get much stronger than the International Court of Justice saying what's going on are acts of genocide against the Palestinian people. You would have thought a country that has had that judgment against it would get a few sanctions imposed on it, wouldn't you? Isn't that kind of what, how it works? Isn't that sort of normal? And then the uh, International Criminal Court uh, judgment that's been made against Netanyahu and others, which um, the British government sort of eventually came around to saying it would accept the judgment of the ICC, actually, the British government has no choice. It has no choice whatsoever. I was in Parliament when we joined the International Criminal Court when we signed up to the Rome Statute. There was a move by various, mainly Tory MPs, to try and exempt Britain from various parts of it, particularly the role of the military, but none of that was carried, and the thing went through in its entirety. Britain is signed up to the International Criminal Court. We are bound by its judgments. Its arrest warrants have to be carried out. It's an obligation. And so, the idea that the British government sort of grandly said eventually they'd accept the judgment and stop challenging it, well, they did drop the challenge, good, and that was only because of a lot of pressure from a lot of people around the country. But again, if there's an arrest warrant out for the prime minister of a country, you'd have thought there would be at least a reconfiguration of diplomatic relations with that country, rather than saying we're gonna carry on as normal, including the supply of weapons overflying and allowing RAF Akrotiri to be used as a staging point in the delivery of weapons to Israel. So our demands on the British government are quite simply this, abide by international law now. Because that, that is what is required. Now, our demonstrations have shown the unity of people in this country. Remember the stuff that's been thrown at us, the stuff that's thrown at all of you in local campaigns, that you are, you are racist, you're filled with hate, you're nasty people, you're dangerous, you're filled with anger and horror. I look at our marches, I look at our demonstrations, and what do I see? I see an enormous 
array of people in front of me from all walks of life, speaking hundreds of different languages, dozens rather, of different languages, following all sorts of different faiths, Jews, Hindus, Muslims, Christians, everybody, all there. And children playing, people playing music, and it is essentially a happy, if very determined, occasion. The idea that this is some kind of march of hate, well, I say to some of the people that write stuff for the BBC, for Sky, and for all of the newspapers and report on social media, get a life, come along and watch what we're doing and talk to the people on the march. Don't follow each other's prejudices, don't follow each other's nonsense, listen to what people are saying. And I'll tell you what, when the history books are written, it's not going to be the Guardian, the Mail, the Telegraph, or the BBC that are seen as heroes in all of this. The people who came out in all weathers, in all conditions, despite all the vilification and the attempts to ban our marches, they're going to be the heroes. They're the ones that were out there making that voice. Now, I've just had the, I've had the two-minute warning, and I've got a very bad reputation with PSC, so I'm trying to rebuild my reputation and, and, uh, with PSC. I hope, I hope this works, so I will finish on this point. The Palestinian people are often seen as victims. Yes, of course they're victims. They're victims of the Nakba, they're victims of the occupation, they're victims of international arms trade and all the rest of it. But they're also a wonderful, cultured, artistic, creative people <clears throat> who achieve absolutely brilliant things. And so what I think we also have to do in all of our events is emphasize Palestinian culture, Palestinian history, Palestinian music, Palestinian learning, and try and understand the straight lines on maps all over the Middle East, and indeed all over Africa for that matter, created at the Treaty of Versailles, which has been so disastrous for all of the peoples of the Middle East region. And uh, try and give people some way of simply understanding. I get sent an awful lot of books in my, uh, my line of work. And we've just produced one from the Peace and Justice Project called The Monstrous Anger of the Guns. It's coming out now, and it's on sale now on the PJP website. We'll obviously be having immense promoting it. What it shows, Andrew Feinstein, myself, and others are part of the authors of it, with Paul Rogers and a number of other people. And it describes the power of the international arms trade, the lobby power of the international arms dealers and weapons manufacturers to influence politics and corrupt our political process. So when it comes out, I urge you to get the book, and we'll be doing a tour on it around the country. And we're encouraging a discussion with those that work in the arms industry about how we can convert their great skills not into making bombs that will kill the children in Gaza, but instead making equipment that can deal with the climate crisis, deal with poverty, and deal with the medical needs of people all over the world. These things are actually possible. And as the danger of wars spread all across the Middle East, with Iran, with Lebanon, with Yemen, uh, the call for peace has never been stronger than it is now and never more necessary. That peace will come with an end to the occupation, the withdrawal of the occupying forces, and recognition of the needs and rights of the people of Palestine. I've been sent a book recently called What Does Israel Fear from Palestine by Raja, Raja Shahade. It's only 100 pages. It's written like a warm essay describing feelings, history, and process. And if you come across somebody on one of your stalls and you're campaigning who knows nothing about the whole issue but is interested, recommend them this book because it's readable and it, it's very educative without being um, over patronizing on people's knowledge or lack of knowledge. Because some people, people are afraid to say they don't really know much about something. This is a way of educating people. And it finishes with the wonderful poem from Rafit Alaria. If I must die, you must live to tell my story. If I must die, let it bring hope. Let it be a tale. Solidarity. Thank you very much.
Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. I think we will...